And welcome back, everybody, to the episode eight of IdeaFlow, the monthly computational law demo and discuss um, community building show, in a sense, that, that we uh, that we like to produce as part of the content of the MIT Computational Law Report. Um, I am Daza Greenwood uh, of MIT, and we are joined by um, most of our core team for the report. Uh, Brian Wilson, our editor-in-chief. Um, also, Andrew Domzalski, our research editor. And uh, we're holding double duty today, Megan Ma, who is uh, not only our managing editor, but she is also uh, playing the role that we've come to call discussant for this show, which is basically someone with a little deeper content and subject matter expertise. Um, and, and Megan's going to help sort of catalyze and lead the discussion. And speaking of words that start with kata, um, our guests today are Katala, uh, who uh, you may know if you've signed up, uh, are pioneering something that's near and dear to our hearts, which is a domain-specific language for law. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand the baton to you, Megan, and, um, and um, invite you to do some um, more specific introductions and get us started. Hi, hello everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm really excited that I was asked to be the discussant for this week, particularly because Katala is doing such an incredible project and is pioneering something that really is on the frontier of legal tech. Um, so what is Katala? So Katala is a domain specific programming language designed for deriving correct by construction implementations of legislative texts. So this week we are joined by Denis and Leanne to discuss their research in the development of this language for law and, and to explore maybe some of the problems and prospects of their language. So Denis comes to us from, as a PhD student from INRIA inside the Prosecco team. Um, he specializes in the study of programming languages and formal verification. Uh, Leanne is a PhD student at, in Paris at the uh, Paris 1 or Pantheon Sorbonne, and she is her thesis is actually focused in data protection and algorithmic law, and together they had developed Katala. So I will then lend the stage over to the two of them to describe a little bit more about Katala and to kind of get us in uh, and take us through. So I'll hand the mic over to you. Thank you, Megan, for the really kind introduction. And thank you, Daza, for the invitation. I am really excited to be presenting this, um, this research project to you today because I'm really looking forward to all your observation and all the discussion we'll have. Um, so I'm Leanne, as uh, Megan said, and together with Denis, we will introduce our language, Catala. Um, just as a quick um, introduction to the project, so. It started with Denis and I two years ago, but now our main team has developed into an interdisciplinary team because we also um, have been joined by Maria Alouzen, who is a sociologist, and she will help us to understand the process of programming together. Um, and we also work with Sarah Lowski, who is a professor of tax law, and she really helps us in the matter of understanding US tax law and how to make it into, a, into an algorithm. Um, so to get started with the proper proper subjects, as you know, um, in order to calculate taxes or social benefits, states use algorithm, meaning that they don't obviously they don't calculate everything by their hand. They just compute all the law into big computers and manage to get all the, the results for each and every individual. Um, in France, um, it's been done by a special team of the DGFIP, Direction Générale des Finances Publiques, which is basically the tax uh, part of the government. And they've done so since the 80s um, and created a very complex language because, uh, sorry, very complex code, um, since it has approximately 1 million lines. So very complicated to, um, to read, maybe Denis, if you want to show us an exemplary of the language, I don't know. 
um, just to show you how it is. Basically, that's what it is. So it's absolutely impossible to understand if you're not a computer scientist. And even if you are, it's quite difficult. It requires a lot of work. Um, so building on that and building on the fact that normally every individual has the right to understand how tax are calculated at tax and social benefits, do you know thought of how would we manage to get it to make it better? We also have to bear in mind that um, tax law changes every year, so it's a in constant evolution, and this is something that is very complicated to implement when you have such a complicated language. So basically what we thought was we could introduce a new methodology to really have accountability in the way we write algorithm and to make sure the algorithm actually matches the law it's supposed to turn into code. But to do that, obviously, we have to have an intense lawyer programmer interaction because the programmer doesn't know the law and the lawyer doesn't know the language, so they have to work together. And so we built on this idea and created a methodology in three points that I will present you now. So the first, um, can you show the three Please, can you show us? Uh, yeah. So the, the first part of our methodology is their programming. Um, in order to have the lawyer understanding the code and the programmer understanding the law, we believe that they have to interact in real time at the moment of code production. And so we did, we did it a few times already. What we do is um, we sit together, we read the law together, and then we produce the code together. And this, this way, we are absolutely sure um, that the lawyer, the computer scientist, really understand the law. And every time we have um, problem or an implication problem, we can discuss it together. So that's the first part of our methodology. The second one is literate programming. Um, so as as I as Denis showed you on the on the screen, we don't know it was the tax uh, code that we have today in France. We have no idea which part of the law the code actually refers to, and that's a problem when you want to make sure. It goes together. So literate programming makes sure that the part of the, of the code you're reading is referring to a specific part of the law. So we will have the law written and then the translation in computer language just under it. So we can always relate to it and so we can discuss always the same document. And lastly, but not least, um, we believe that the code must be open source. Obviously, um, there is some, especially in France, laws that oblige the state to um, publish algorithms that are used for tax law or social benefits, but it also makes the states and people who calculate the tax more accountable. It also happened that people from the outside, citizens can access to that and check if it's right and have ways to maybe contest um, their taxes in, in this matter. Um, but to do so, obviously, it's impossible with the language that you've seen just before, because I, uh, as a lawyer, even if I specialize in data protection and algorithm, it's absolutely impossible for me to understand. So we need to find a way for lawyers to be able to read the code, or at least be able to understand it. And this is why we actually had to create a domain specific language, which is the talent. And I'll let Denis uh, take on with that. Thanks, Lian, for introducing the methodology and the observations that led us to create Catala. And the basic idea of the language is that if the code should reflect the algorithm, then let's write both together side by side to compare them with that literate programming style. And to create a programming language that enables such a, a style of programming, uh, we have to follow the logical structure of the code, which follows something called default logic, which is a type of logic that uh, has been uh, uncovered by various scholars in the 18, 80s, 90s, but also more recently by Sarah Lowski regarding more precisely the US tax code. And the, the way it looks is, is simple. You basically 
in order, if you want to produce uh, an implementation of some of uh, the stat some of statutes of the U.S. tax code, you text you take the text of the statutes, and then you're going to put a snippet of Catalan code just uh, next to the statutes that will effectively capture the meaning, the algorithmic meaning of what the text is. And then you, you go to the next part of the statute and you repeat the process until the whole body of legislation is formalized. Uh, so after you have done that formalization process according to the methodology that Jan presented, you want to deploy Catala programs in uh, production IT systems. And for that, for, to offer the biggest amount of flexibility, we uh, intend to use not a scheme of interpretation and an API to fetch results via some business, uh, via some rules engine, but rather simply to compile the code into a static library that can be directly used by the IT system that you use in the native programming language of that IT system. So uh, for instance, if you are a large organization that needs the rules to be centralized and then distributed, uh, to be used in various parts of your IT system. You can have your Catala program compiled down to C if you want to do batch computation or even COBOL if you're on an old mainframe. You can also compile it to JS to embed it inside, inside into websites or to R or Python or MATLAB if you want your economists to run some models of uh, what it would uh, have as an impact to change uh, some part of the loop. So that's basically for the five minute pitch of, of Catala. More info can be found on this website whose address is shown. And then maybe I can follow up with a little demo of what a larger program looks like, or we can uh, show you the trace of a program. So Megan, it's up to you to, to tell us what you want. Yes, absolutely. I think that people would really benefit from seeing Catala in action. So yeah, take it away. So. Uh, let me, ta, ta, ta. yes. So here's the, a more um, fleshed out version of that uh, implementation of section 132 of the US tax code that I've shown you earlier. So basically the structure of the code follows the structure of the statute, but as a prologue, uh, you might want to uh, encode the data structures that the Catala program is going to use. So you're basically going to declare your uh, data structures, but also function signatures in this little box here. Uh, so here we have an enumeration because it discounts. The, the, the statute talks about like some kind of discounts which can be like excluded or included in your uh, in some kind of tax deduction, right? So the discounts uh, can be either on a property or so by services that are uh, sold to the company to one of its employees. And then you have this concept of scope, which is uh, kind of a function, but it's a function that's adapted to the uh, legal concept, to the legal uh, version of what an abstraction is, because it's a function that's uh, where you can actually access the local variable and tweak them from the uh, exterior, which is some something that you might want to do if you want to build like larger applications uh, with uh, different modules that uh, talk together and when you're doing that uh, by implementing legal statutes, you might notice that these modules, abstractions modules, they kind of tweak their internals in kind of a spaghetti code manner. Uh, so then you can, Catala is a programming language, so you have to like uh, define some codes or here you have, uh, uh, you define it, whether it's its property or not, this is a Boolean and then you match the, the type of the discount with if it's a property, then true for services and false, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have this, this kind of uh, literate programming implementation where you have one sentence or two sentences of the, the statute and then up you have the, the implementation. In the B you have the same thing and you can see that the code snippets are of course bigger than the text of the law since generally the text of the statute is really concise and contains a lot of information which you have to unpack when you're implementing it. But as you can see, the, the size of the snippets, they, they are not too large either. You can review, review them and like fit them in, in, inside of single screen. And, and as you can see also, uh, you don't go that fast, uh, it's also quite simple. So I mean, if, even if you've never coded, 
you were able to understand how how it works. So I would be very happy to have your opinion on that on, for the lawyers to tell me if they actually believe that it's not that complicated, but we really made it like the best effort to make it as simplest as possible and also to use all the legal terms inside the code. So if you want to see it in action, actually on another, on another page of the website, the friend family benefits computation, which is currently the most fleshed out example that we have for roughly uh, 1,500 lines of code. Uh, you can see we built a fully fledged simulator of uh, you input your uh, situation for the household and then it shows you how much uh, family benefits you're allowed to uh, in, in, with respect to the current French law. And uh, for instance, if you, uh, so here, this child is uh, in split custody. So if you, uh, to move the, the custody to be to being split or being like full, then you can see the amount changed in real time and, and below here. And the computation is going is going really fast because everything is compiled statically to a JS program that interprets natively in the in the, the browser engine. So it, it goes and faster than most uh, rules engine that you have seen. And we can guarantee that it's absolutely the same as what the law said because we yes. put it together for hours and hours and it's totally the same thing and if you want to check well you have the law just under it yes this is really fascinating and i think one thing that i'd be interested in first is you showed us a little bit of the code um just now um is it possible for us to see actually the natural language version of the legislative text and we can see kind of like a side by side comparison of how the natural language had transformed into Katala? So the natural language, this is like the actual source code of uh, what powers this web page and this, this is what it looks like. So here you have the metadata, which is like the signatures and data structures I've talked to you about. And then you're just having marked down like the sections of the statute and here's the text of the statute, And here's the, the Canada snippet. This, this is really what you edit as a programmer and mm -hmm. as a lawyer, this is what you see. Fantastic. So I guess maybe I'll kick us off with a couple of questions, uh, seeing sort of your incredible presentation and also a bit of a demo of Catala. Um, and then I will open up the floor, um, as I'm sure the audience is kind of waiting in anticipation to um, ask you more. Um, so to start, uh, the word kind of domain specific language um, is kind of tossed around here. So I think in your perspective, what do you actually define as a domain specific language for law? Um, it seems to me at the moment that Catala acts as almost a translator, uh, not only between natural language, but also actually into sort of machine readable code for other programming languages. So I kind of want to see what your perspective is on how you define a domain specific language. Uh, so Jan, unless you have something to add, I think this is more, more of a question for me. So. <clears throat> I come from the community of programming languages and in that research community, we have like uh, very precise terms to define what is a language, what is a translation, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, a domain specific, so for me, domain specific language is just a programming language uh, whose expressivity is restricted to a certain domain. And that, that's all it is actually. And for instance, in Catala, you're not going to be able to implement a sorting algorithm or to implement like a, 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 some kind of web services or something like that. The, 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 the primitives and the kind of expressions you can embed in the language are strictly limited to only what you would be using when translating law into code. And then, of course, Catala is a programming language, so it has a compiler because or all programming languages have a compiler or an interpreter. And uh, the compiler of Catala happens to translate Catala to other programming languages. But this is a kind of a classic scheme in programming languages because apart from the, like, the mainstream ones like Java, C, Python, et cetera, which can execute directly, if you build your other like smaller domain specific programming language, you might just piggyback on existing 
programming languages that effectively run because the the work of creating a runtime environment and actually compiled onto assembly because that's that's where things happen on the machine is really excruciating and you don't need to repeat that any every time yeah really fascinating and i think sort of and this is probably a question now um towards paired programming it seems that both of you are incredible enthusiasts around sort of sitting side by side and working through um, legislative text and kind of transforming it to this very literate sort of code. Um, what do you find were sort of the initial startup um, problems? Uh, perhaps there were actual translation issues between the two disciplines, uh, given that Leanne, you're from law and Denis, you're from programming. So. Uh, I'd be interested in more in hearing more uh, how you actually get, got into the rhythm of this paired programming process. Um, I maybe will begin to answer and then then you can complete what I'm saying. Um, so I, I think we must first start to say that um, Denis and I, like it's very complicated for lawyer and computer scientists to talk, just like to have a conversation. And I think Denis and I were very lucky to be able to, to to have enough knowledge about each other discipline, but also enough like open mind to be able to really get on the words and on the specificities of each and everyone's like uh, discipline. So I think that's um, actually something that is very difficult to do uh, when you start uh, on the, doing that. So it's like a barrier of just, do we speak the same language? So that was like the first thing that must be taken into account. Um, but then after that, I think because I went towards like computer science and then came towards law, we basically kind of found a way to do that, which was natural. And I think um, it kind of, it's possible for everyone because some of my students did it with some of uh, Denise's interns and we have other people we used Catala and it takes time to build this kind of working relationship. Um, but it does work because we have like um, somewhere where we can do it together. And I, I will also add that it's a very, very stimulating uh, and very interesting process. I mean, we like when we code together, we can be two hours on one paragraph and we don't see the time go on because it's so interesting. And we like really talk and discuss every meaning of the law and it's really, really nice uh, thing to do together. That was a great answer, Ian. I don't have anything to add. <laughs> so I see we've got a really interesting question from Brian. Uh, do you want to do you want to pop off mute and put it put it out there? It, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you, Megan, but I didn't. I want to make sure we don't lose this this thread of thought that Brian's putting out. Yeah, yeah. That's, I I was just about to open up the floor. So okay, what timing? Um, so one question that I've I was thinking about as you're going through, and I think this is something that, you know, a lot of open source projects have to address at some point um, in terms of, you know, how they phase their growth, you know, from the idea to the, you know, version one to the version two and on and on and on. And so the, the kind of key question that I've got is around how you all are doing that. So how do you want people to engage with Katala and what is the best case scenario for getting people involved with you all? What does that look like to you? And, and what what's kind of and I'll add another one to that. Like what's what's like the best case scenario that you can imagine for Catala? This is a very good question. And I think that unlike like a traditional open source project, uh, Catala is really focused on experts. It's a tool for experts. And this is why I've, I've been getting in touch with various parts of the French administration, like each of the, the lines of the tables that you have seen earlier. I like contacted the response, the person responsible for maintaining the code bases in each of them, in one of them. And uh, so, so far with the French tax administration, it's getting well. I've been able to meet the developers. I've been able to meet the lawyers that uh, specify this kind of things. And uh, we're, in the phase where we're talking budget for like rewriting everything in Catala. So I, I don't, of course, things can happen. Uh, nothing is sure until like the, the thing is stemmed by the authorities. But uh, this is 
this is the best case scenario with, of what would happen actually with Gazelle. So I've got a I've got a short follow up, which is um, I don't know. You you might think it's interesting. You might not. But like I think I think that. The, like I, this is a very commendable thing to kind of like go out and do all that stuff with all of these people and like track them down and, um, and uh, you know kind of like make it into the, into what what you have and I think that's awesome. I I I would be really interested if there was like a, a way that you know different people who could could maybe like qualify as experts could you know kind of get involved or. Um, if there were if there were kind of like trial things that you could kind of you know try out and then one of the experts could approve it or um, something like that because I think what gets where it gets really interesting and where you know the network effects of open source projects kind of uh, exist or when you sort of democratize the access to the editing so you know a lot of people had similar ideas around you know the encyclopedias being edited by just anyone. And now Wikipedia has become, you know, a source of, you know, very high trust relative to its cost. And so I'd be interested if there was something like that, not maybe it's not like a full kind of, uh, you know, 1000% open, but I, I would be interested to learn more about, you know, that process for opening things up so that you could get some of that um, involvement, some of that participation that I think will be really needed in the future. This your remark is really relevant because uh, this is this actually ties to a kind of an accountability and democratic issue of uh, how do you enforce the law when you're like a public agency or government, and uh, you know there are laws in various countries that mandate the government to open up its code bases, but so far it hasn't shown any effect. My hope is that if we managed to have the states have its official implementation in Catala and opened up, then. That, that would draw as an incentive for people to actually learn the language because they can actually edit and read and understand and propose suggestions to what their government is doing. So I think that's the model that uh, I'm trying to aim for. Yeah, that's really cool. One, and this is just kind of an idea that I've talked about with a few people before, but I, I don't know if in France they have kind of like a continuing education requirement like they do here in the US, but it might be really cool to make, like offer people to get continuing education hours for maintaining the, the legal code base or that that side of things that could be a really interesting incentive mechanism that could be kind of like mandated among a trusted network of people. That's a great idea and I think that uh, the government is always looking for free labor since they have to reduce their uh, <laughs> the number of civil servants so maybe maybe they like that idea. <laughs> That, that idea is completely free for everybody. <laughs> Great. Uh, we have a question from Andre. Andre, not sure if you wanted to uh, ask it yourself. Uh... Yeah, uh, I, I, I put the, the question in the chat, but, uh, but it can, can, can make here. Uh, uh, my doubt, uh, uh, it, it, First of all, congratulations for for the presentation. I, I had to to enter late in the the, the session, but uh, it, it very it is very interesting how to translate legal language to code. But but we have some hiccups. We we have uh, a generic expressions, generic language in some legal test texts. How we can deal with this? How how do you propose to deal with this? Uh, how to translate to code this kind of openness, uh, this kind of generic language that uh, it's common in, in some some legal language. Um, thank you for this question because it's actually really important and we've put a lot of thinking on that. So I'll just answer. But before you go on. Um, little anecdote, when Denis came to me at the beginning and told me about the project, I didn't know much about domestic language. And I said, that's like, it's impossible to translate tax law into code because no one knows what legal words mean. So it's, it's impossible. And by doing that, I understood that actually there's so many ways to resolve it. So I, it's been a really important problem for me. And I think it's for lawyers, it's the first step that is like, wait, that's not possible, but it actually is. Um, 
because what you, your question is basically about interpretation and ambiguity of the law. And we, lo we know that the law has so many words that no one can really understand what it means. And scholars would argue years on what, I don't know, let's say contract means, for example. Um, so we have two ways of dealing with that. The first way, obviously, is to try to solve the ambiguity, meaning we go read case law, we read literature, we check with specialists and experts, and we try to solve the ambiguity. If we can find a way to solve it, we will put the source into the code, not as a part of the code, but just as a reference for people who want to check it. So that will be like a way to say, okay, so we chose this interpretation because of this reason. So we're completely transparent on the problem and on the way we solve it. So that's the base case scenario. Sometimes that's not possible because there would be things that are just too ambiguous or that no one noticed yet. We had um, we had an example which took us, like we talked about that when we included the facts for a three hours or something like that. And we're like, okay, we just have no idea how, which, how to calculate this thing. So we just leave it open. We say, we don't know for this reason. So this is the first interpretation we can have. Then this is the second one. And that would be the result. Um, and this way, like there's no, we don't decide on something that we cannot decide on and we rest in our jurisdiction in a way. And it's also where open source is very important because in this way, maybe other people could help us to solve that. Um, yeah, so I hope I, I answered your question. Maybe Duny, if you want to add something. Yeah, I would say that by leaving it open, Jan means uh, putting it as a user input. You as the user that use the system can choose what interpretation of the law you want to give. That, that's okay, good. perfect. It, it was perfectly answered. Uh, my my concern, my main concern was that by translating a lot to code, uh, we we we, uh, we make some uh, previous adjudication of some cases. We we decide previously what the law says or not for something cases. It's excluding some situations that could be. Uh, uh, under the the, the, the the norm, under the, the legal norm, and uh, restricting the, the 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 sense of the the, the legal norm. Uh, this this was the, the my main uh, uh, concern. And and uh, but but when when do you when when you make sure that the the choices are transparent? Are open. Uh, this could be a, a, a good case in order to uh, revise or review the the translation later in the process when some hard case or some specific case comes to to adjudication or comes to. Thank you. Yes, yes, you're you're right, and it's we're being really cautious about that because it's a problem with like we thought about that a lot, but so thank you for raising this question. And, and, and it's a problem that is being highly discussed when we deal with AI, with the, the, the control and auditing of AI. It's, it, 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 in some senses, the, 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 the same problem, but we are, we are applying to another field. Excellent. And Speaking of AI, we have another question um, on the table, which includes extrapolating into a future that may may leverage. Oh, I'm sorry, Megan, did you want to? Oh, I was going to say, actually, Divya had raised her hand next, so I'm oh. not sure if you wanted to uh, go on that okay, thread first. Or... Yes, I, I, forgive me, I didn't, I can't, or I don't know no, no, how please, to see please, the hand you raising. Continue. I'll first listen um, to you, and then I'll say something. I'll listen to you first, yeah, please. Oh, very good. Okay, then. So we now have a queue. Um, and uh, let's just say next up is Blake. Um, and then right to you, Divya. Uh, and I apologize for jumping the queue if I if I did. Um, but uh, but picking that thread up again, um, the, uh, Blake um, has a question that includes uh, looking at potential ways to leverage machine learning for the human uh, human machine interface. But I want to highlight one one aspect before we get into Blake's question, which is he brings up something that was I was also wondering about, which is this notion of const what 
Blake calls and some people call constrained language. Um, it goes by various names, but just to unpack that a little bit for those that may not be familiar, it's this concept of using a, excuse me, a subset of natural language, but only only permitting the um, kind of vocabulary and and some other you know kind of a grammar that is directly um, mapped to um, to um, statements that uh, that can be expressed through machine readable code. Um, you know, like a, the if then and greater than and you know other other things, um, so that humans once they learn this dialect um, can um, ex can express themselves in a way where there's very little chasm between what they've said and being able to do a verifiable um, refactoring, I guess, or encoding, if you will, um, into the applicable machine language. Um, so that's what Blake means, as, as far as I understand, by constrained language. But with, with that sort of context, um, Blake, did you want to come off mute and ask your question, or would you like me to maybe just um, read for the record what you have in the chat? Oh, yeah, I, I was just going to jump in real quick. This is a really cool project. I think this is awesome. Um, I, you know, and I, I guess when I see something like this, I'm, I'm kind of problem solving or oriented. So when I look at it, it's like, you know, is there a way to talk about law in a way that we restrict nouns, verbs, and, and so on and so forth, so that it, it embodies what the law is saying, but at the same time, it lends itself um, very readily to a programmer or someone that's using the library to, um, you know, when, if we're still having human interaction in, in this process, does it accelerate it? Where we can read in that, that corpus from the original law and it is able to distill uh, the meaning of what what the law says by using that, you know, that at, the expert basically has to seed the constrained language to begin with. So you would have to have, uh, with the respective, uh, you know, uh, interpretations by language and law. But once you have that distilled, then, you know, you can even create a tool in which someone that is an attorney that can interpret the law can construct uh, logical. Um, elements that they find in the law and then just hand that over to a programmer and then the interactions become basically verification routines as opposed to um, I guess kind of boiling the ocean from the start and then if you put a machine under witnessing that over iterations then we can actually get semi-automatic or automatic translations so and I have a ten tendency to jump way ahead so <laughs> and and I did like the first question about how we interact with this library, maybe to experiment with things like that. So, um, and I, I was just curious: is there any plan to explore uh, explore any um, tools like that or any process like that? That was it. Thank you. Thank you, Blake. Maybe I can take the question, uh, Jan. Um, so, what you're referring to is called a constrained uh, natural languages. Uh, this is like the term there. It's an active research area. There, it's a different school of thought than mine. Uh, but basically, I would say that you have to do a trade-off between the granularity uh, with which you want to follow the legal text and the simplicity of the code that you're going to produce. If you, if you want to use constrained natural language, then you're going to want to build sentences that like map the original text of the law. But when you do that, then you have to incorporate all the, the things that the law talks about. And when you read the statutes, not all of the part of the law actually mean something in terms of computing. They can talk about other things and stuff. And also, if you want to use the constrained natural languages, uh, I mean, this is kind of the idea of the that the Singaporean people uh, that are doing the L4 uh, domain-specific language, they're kind of exploring that idea. And then you have to uh, model in your language these notions of like the uh, uh, logic, which means like who can do something, who can shan't do something, shall do something. 
then you have to build that actor model inside your language to be able to like follow what the law is saying. And in the end, you have a very complicated programming language. And then you can't use the same simple techniques of compilation, which I'm doing for like integration. You have to use other techniques. So I would say it's a different school of thought. And uh, I would very much like to see improvements in that area and also like evaluation on real world systems. Uh, concerning the machine learning part of your question, this is actually like a, a dream that many have because uh, formalizing the law, it's really hard and it's really tedious and we've done it for several hours with Lian. Uh, so it's a process in which you learn a lot about the law and you gain competence, etc. But of course, it, if it could be automatized, we would be all the more happy. Uh, so I'm, I'm sending actually in the chat uh, two papers that have attempted to use machine learning for formalizing parts of statutes. They date from 2017 and 2020. And with the current NLP uh, techniques, uh, they conclude that the techniques are not up to the challenge and they have poor results in their evaluation section. Maybe the technology will improve, but uh, at this time, uh, it doesn't seem to be viable. I think Great. since we have quite a question queue sort of forming, um, my recommendation is that perhaps we'll ask all the questions at once and then it'll be a tough job for uh, Denis and Leanne to kind of fire off uh, their reactions. Um, and obviously this is very exciting, which is why we have so many questions. So we'll start with Divya, then we'll have Jeff and Misha, and finally with Brian. Divya, you, you have the floor. <clears throat> Thank you. I do hope I'm properly audible. So first of all, I'll take uh, like 90 seconds or so. I'm sorry to say. First thing, amazing, amazing project. Oh my God. I'm having all sorts of crazy ideas right now. So uh, first thing first, uh, I don't know how you guys got this idea of turning law into code. It's amazing. My background is engineering and law. So I enjoy doing that, but people used to call me crazy. Now I can tell them MIT is already doing it. So don't call me crazy. That's uh, settled. Now, well, my credit, question credit is... You, by the way, it's uh, Katala. Um, MIT is just, the, uh, just uh, happy to be communicating and propagating their good ideas. It's awesome. It's it's I, I just don't have words to explain how excited I am because MIT was the first place where I wanted to apply for my PhD, but then they did not have law. So mostly I used to get uh, no as an answer. But anyways, so um, uh, my question is, you are trying to turn law into code. That's perfectly fine. But right now, if I can understand, it is only being uh, 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 only US is being taken as a data center as an input center or is it worldwide data because indian data uh, as much as i know except supreme court and couple of high courts uh, most data is not online and that is what is going to affect the whole uh, data centric uh, conversion of uh, this your uh, your coding right because uh, every case in lower courts in India is a very different aspect of it. And how are you looking forward to converting it in regional uh, dimensions? And how, how how soon are we going to be to be reality? Because I am really excited and I would love to see at least run this kind of thing in my courts and possibly as soon as possible. So please do let me know how demography will work and uh, how geography is going to help and if I can be of any help in Indian uh, way, because I practice in Supreme Court of India and that's pretty much the center. So <laughs> that would be like uh, something I would enjoy to uh, provide data if possible. Please do guide me as in how demography is going to help this coding or coding is going to help demographics issues being solved. I may be vague. I'm really sorry, guys, if I'm not making sense. You may say that I don't want to answer the question, but if you can find sense, please do answer. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Divya. Jeff, you have the floor. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. <laughs> um, so I'm an, I'm an attorney based in, in Luxembourg. Um, and I I couldn't follow everything that was said by the webinar, but just my, my question, an, an upfront question, is this to encode 
uh, regulation and law? So, so state issued regulation, or is it also about contracts? It's uh, mostly state issued regulation, but then, uh, I mean, if your contract is drafted as a legal statute, then you can use the same tool, right? Because it's a programming language, so you can use for different uses. Maybe I can, I can answer to Divya as well, Megan? Yeah, sure. If yeah. that's okay. So, uh, uh, Divya, um, Catala has uh, several front ends. There is uh, currently an English front end, a French front end, and a Polish front end. You can actually like uh, translate the keywords of the language into anything that you want. So I guess Indian is Indian, Hindi or English would not be a problem. And as for the material, even if it's not online, I mean, uh, as long as you have your hand on it, you can pull it into a file and write it. It's not, it's not, you, you don't, it doesn't have to be online for you to use it in a Catala program, right? But the uh, Catala, the, the data that Catala pulls from is, mostly the statutes, the legal statutes. It's not like the, the cases. And the applications of Catala are more geared towards statutory law than case law or common law. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, Misha, you have the floor, and then we'll have Brian uh, with the last question. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm not a computer scientist or a lawyer, but I am the co-founder of uh, Project Canopy, which is a startup NGO for uh, providing environmental intelligence uh, about the Congo Basin rainforest. And one of our projects is about reading the laws uh, for all six Congo Basin countries. Um, obviously, these are Francophone countries, so it's Napoleonic code, uh, which lends itself well to algorithmic uh, interpretation. Um, but I've uh, I actually came across Denise's paper uh, when it released last November, and I thought, okay, this is a good start. Um, so I'm very excited to see the progress that you guys have made, and I'm very happy to be here today with you. Um, my question is about, uh, you know, interfacing with other uh, approaches to, you know, the broader uh, problems of knowledge management. Uh, we've been looking at knowledge graphs in particular, which seem to be having a renaissance in the last couple of years. Um, knowledge graphs are more domain agnostic, uh, more flexible. Um, and I would like to get you, but, but this is like, you know, from the statutory point of view, this is very specific. It's very laser focused. And that's what I like about it. Um, so I would like to kind of get your opinion on uh, basically the idea of uh, is there a way for this kind of very narrow but very foundational work that you're doing to interface more broadly with knowledge graphs? So building on Jeff's question about statutes versus contracts, one of the things that we want to do is we want to process all of the contracts for logging in the Congo Basin. That's about a thousand concessions, a thousand contracts, but they also have to interface with the law. So, so we want to know what the law says, and we want to know what that means vis-a-vis -vis -vis the, the contracts and the individual companies that respond to those contracts. Uh, so it's a bit of a vague question. I apologize for that. But, but I, I think you get the gist of it, of like, how do you take something as specific uh, and narrowly scoped as Catala and, and make it work with uh, you know, the broader uh, environment, in this case, knowledge graphs? Thank you. Thank you for your question. I, I think the answer lies into the operational uh, deployment of Catala, meaning that you can compile it to whatever you want. It's, it's, it's just a lambda calculus. So I guess I don't know the, the exact representation of knowledge graph that you're using, but we can think of like a Catala backend to, to your knowledge graph representation. That's not a technical problem. Hello. Yeah. Hello, Denise. Right. Uh, my name is Brian. I am from Trinidad and Tobago, and I'm a barrister in England and Wales as well. And my, I love the technology because I see where it's, it's, it's heading. But in terms of interpretation, it raises a bit of concerns, especially, let's say, from a statutory position, where, for example, in a constitutional matter, at times, we need judges to come and interpret the law because at times the draftsman makes it deliberately wide or deliberately narrow. 
So in terms of constrained translation or missing out on translation, because code has to be very succinct. So are we, are we going to lose out on interpretation? Because if you go so narrow, and at times the draftsman makes it, leaves a, a deliberate ambiguity, where are we going with this? Because at times you need it wide as well. So that's my question. Um, I think that's uh, slightly similar to the question Andre asked. So I think um, I don't have much to answer, like to add more than what we already said, but we could take that into account and we try to solve the ambiguity when we can. And if we can't, we just leave it as a choice. Um, though I think the text we choose to code in Catala are not as ambiguous as others. For example, we don't code criminal law. We code law that is slightly less ambiguous in its terms. And that's also a choice. Um, yeah, so that's basically my answer. Jenny, if you want to add something, maybe? No, perfect. OK. Um, thank you so much. Um, I see we're, we're nearly at the end of our of our all too short hour on this, we could go on for a semester, I think, uh, on this. And maybe we should circle back with uh, these folks to talk about incorporating into some of our computational law um, teaching opportunities. But um, I just wanted to sort of wrap and to synthesize by, by bringing forward a couple of maybe relevant ideas from law.mit.edu. Um, especially on that last point. Uh, so there's a kind of a design pattern that, that I've used sometimes in my, in my uh, professional work and that we've talked about as a research direction. And um, very broadly, you could call it BLT, uh, business, legal, and technical, uh, by separating these dimensions of a system, a tax system, uh, transactional system, what have you. It can be easier to align what's happening at, at each one of those layers and uh, and have designs that, um, that that work all the more efficiently and uh, measurably solve for the requirements that come from you know business and operations from law and from technology requirements and constraints one way that that plays out in that in the last question from Brian is we've been exploring um, and I've been involved in a couple of projects where the way that the, the lawmaker expresses the rules are in three um, dialects, you could say. One of them is normal, same old, legal, dense text of law um, that you'd see in any statute uh, or regulation or dense contracts. The second way is um, uh, human readable, you might say, which is a like a plain language, simplified, like maybe like ninth grade reading level um, summary of, of what that provision means. Um, and then the third way, of course, is the corresponding machine readable language for those provisions of the law, which are amenable to that. Um, if it's not, you know, as you as we sort of touched on many times, some parts of law are intended to be almost functional and are and, and can better be translated to directly in some way to machine processes. Other parts of law may be uh, for interpretation or, or may have to do with things that are not intended and are not a good fit, at least at this point, to be expressed in machine readable ways. But for the parts that, that are functional, we actually like have these sort of three almost tabs is how we started um, having the um, rulemaking process work in a city of Boston uh, um, uh, example uh, where, uh, where we basically made sure that we got review and alignment and harmonization and ultimately direct integration of the plain language, legal language, and and uh, computer language dimensions of each one of the provisions. Um, so that's just one one thing to consider when 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 thinking of design patterns to address um, you know the tensions that Brian was just bringing up. Um, and the last thing I want to say is I just want to echo everybody's kudos uh, to you on this fine project. Um, it really, I think, shows good thought leadership. It's very timely. Um, and I, I think it's a great example 
of what we mean, at least in, in this uh, functional area, by computational law. A very direct example. So uh, you're to be commended, and, and we really hope that you keep with it, you keep evolving this. Um, and I encourage those that hear these words later um, on our YouTube channel to take a look at the GitHub repo and consider trying it out yourself and reporting what, what you find and, and help the evolution of, of this um, useful approach. So with that, thank you everybody uh, on behalf of law.mit.edu for participating in this episode eight of IdeaFlow. And we hope to see you next month on the last Friday at 12 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and you can sign up at law.mit.edu forward slash media. So until then, have a good one. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.